OK, welcome back to CMP591. Uh, first of all, I have uh, one good and one bad news for you. Uh, the good news is that uh, next week we have, uh, I will be hosting the uh, NATO panel uh, on cognitive radio, cognitive radio 2 panel uh, in Istanbul at Boğaziçi University. Therefore, we will not have any lecture, at least not with me. Uh, so that's the good news for you uh, yourself. Uh, but the uh, bad news is uh, my postdoc will be substituting me. He will be covering the rest of the chapter on WiMAX. Remember, uh, we stopped before mobility in WiMAX, so he will be covering mobility and then the mesh mode of WiMAX. So that will be a short lecture. And uh, therefore, today I will be skipping that part and continuing uh, with the next chapter, which is on cognitive radio basics. Uh, also, one other bad news is that you will be having a short quiz next week. Uh, which will be related to what we have done in wireless LAN and uh, WiMAX. It will be a simple quiz, don't worry. Okay, so now we start a new topic, which is uh, actually the rest of the course that will be on cognitive radio. So what's our motivation for yet another new technology? The motivation is that spectrum allocation is an important problem but it's a difficult problem. It has been typically solved with uh, what we call static allocation, which is organized by uh, typically a governmental uh, body in every country. That would be FCC in the United States, Ofcom in the United Kingdom. In Turkey, it's called BTK, BTK. So what these institutions or these bodies do is actually try to decide which frequency band is to be used by which institution or organization, whatever. Uh, in the case of wide countries like the United States, it is possible to release the permission to use for a frequency band to different organizations in different parts of the country. But in smaller uh, countries, uh, since the distances are not so large, it doesn't make sense to locally distribute this right to use. So they're distributed countrywide. That's also the case in Turkey. In Turkey, if you uh, get the permission to use a frequency band, then you use it for the whole country. Okay. So to do this allocation, to decide who will use which technology, uh, typically these permissions are given for long durations. Typically, this is for several decades because that organization or company or whatever has to make a lot of investments for that technology. And if you change the frequency, typically, actually, the hardware changes. So that means all that investment is actually gone. At least most of that investment is gone. So you have to, uh, if you just change the frequency band, just because of this reason, you have to change almost all of the hardware. Okay, so that's a major problem. Therefore, these permissions are, uh, are released, as I said, for several decades. But that's, that is where the problem lies, actually. Because if from today, in 2013, you try to release the uh, permissions for a frequency band, let's say for two decades, to, let's say, a mobile operator, which technology are you going to allow in this band? That's the first question. Second is, how wide should that band be? This is again related to technology. Depends on the technology, plus depends on the uh, people's, the customers' interest in the technology. How many people will be using that technology? And how much transmissions will they require for the technology? That determines, actually, the bandwidth of that frequency, frequency band. So to decide all these, you have to make very good forecasts 
And, unfor and unfortunately, this is very difficult. This depends on several different factors. Like everybody is discussing uh, whether WiMAX will survive or not today. Actually, a few years ago, WiMAX was considered to be the best technology. So there are actually other factors behind. Sometimes it's technical, sometimes it's business. And sometimes it's just the invention of another technology. When some alternative technology, some good alternative technology arises, then some technologies that were considered to be very promising a few years ago may now be, become obsolete. Okay? So it's quite difficult to foresee the changes in technology. But then all the frequency assignments, spectrum assignments you have done are now outdated. But unfortunately, you cannot change it because you have released the right to that company for, let's say, two decades. You cannot change your mind after five years because if you do so, then that company has the right to ask for the reimbursement of all the investment that has been done for that technology, which nobody, of course, wants to pay. Okay. That is the reason why, as you look at it today, most of the spectrum is unfortunately underutilized. Because things have changed in time. This is not to blame anyone. As I said, this is really a difficult task. And the current state of the technology by then did not allow any flexibility here. But as of now, with the improvements in technology, now we have some, quote unquote, some uh, flexibility in technology. And still we need to improve a lot to utilize this uh, properly. So as you said, it's very difficult to foresee the changes in technology in the markets and the user demands. Today, people might be all uh, trending towards uh, 3G, LT, and because of that, you estimate that LT advanced will boom. Tomorrow, it may change. Okay. One important thing is air is a public resource, and you're not allowed to sell the spectrum in any country. What you do is you rent it for long decades. So you're not allowed to transmit on the air as you wish, except for the ISM bands. And these are very limited spectrum bands. Uh, in other parts of the spectrum, first you have to get the permission to transmit. And to get the permission, typically you have to pay for it. The allocation is typically managed by a regulatory uh, body, as I said, it's FCC in US, Ofcom in UK, Bilgi Teknolojileri ve İletişim Kurumu, BTK, previously known as Telekomünikasyon Kurumu, TK, in Turkey. And this allocation, as you said, is quasi-static. It's not completely static because, as I said, it's just granted for some fixed duration, but these are typically very long durations. Yes? What if you use a part of spectrum in private? Uh, without permission yes. and outside the ISM band, yes. then uh, you will be fined actually, if someone figures it out. Who can find it? Who can find it? Well, it's actually the, in Turkey, it's the duty of BTK to follow it, or FCC in the US. Uh, your question might be, will they ever find me? Uh, probably. If you do it for a very short time, they may not realize that. But if you repeatedly do this, they will figure it out. What happens is the following, actually. There are also methods of sensing the spectrum. Actually, that's what we're going to do in cognitive radio. You sense the spectrum. If you find some t someone transmitting other than the expected transmitters, you figure out that there's a problem. Now the question is, uh, if it was over the wire, just follow the wire. But if it's wireless, how do you find it? There, there are uh, methods for locating wireless transmitters. That's actually, uh, bless you, that's actually what you're using
today uh, for uh, localization. Like, you want to use Google Maps? You see the icon showing where you are. Either because you have GPS, but if you don't have GPS or if it's disabled, still you can see that uh, the system finds, uh, well, not uh, maybe very accurate if you don't have GPS, but it shows where you are. And how does that happen? We have localization techniques. The most uh, famous ones would be uh, trilateration or multilateration techniques. If, if you're a transmitter and there are multiple receivers, it's possible to find you. Okay? Just take it this way. Just close your eyes and I will be speaking at some part of this room. If multiple people hear me and they collaborate, they can estimate where I am. Nah, not exactly, but in a pretty good way. Okay, so yes, it is possible to uh, detect it. One other thing is the following. Uh, what are you going to use to transmit? Which device? Now, the devices, all of the devices you're using are actually certified. And for that certification, the transmission uh, frequencies are actually tested. For example, this device is also wireless. This wireless mouse is doing some transmissions. It's using the ISM band. That is why uh, this is imported. That's why uh, they could import it. During the import operation, since it has communication capability, it has to be certified. And that certification actually uh, is done by checking the transmissions. And there are laboratories in Turkey, in Islam Technical University, and also in other countries in different places. Uh, there are labs that are testing these devices. Uh, if you want to do, uh, if you want to operate in a band that does not belong to you, in that case you would have to develop your own hardware. Because the current hardware would not allow you to transmit in those bands. So you have to develop your own hardware. This is of course doable, and of course there are people who are doing it, but it's definitely not legal and it's definitely not recommended. Uh, anyways, uh, as we said, the allocation is quasi static, and uh, you should uh, realize that technologies become obsolete in time, so you have to cope with this. Now, this is the famous frequency allocation map from FCC. Everyone working on cognitive radio is using the same map. Uh, actually, it's, of course, uh, it's quite old, actually. Some parts of it might have changed. Uh, also, it's specific to US. You can do the similar things in Turkey. For example, in Turkey, it's not shown as a map, but you can just query which bands are being used by which uh, company or institution by just going to the BTK site, but it's the old website, so it's, it's still STK. You can just uh, go to the BTK website and query it one by one. Once you do that, then you can form the map, color the map. Now, these lines, as you can see, the map is in lines. Actually, it's a single line, but it won't fit. That's why it's broken into lines. If you just focus in some parts, you see that it is colored and labeled with different technologies, the same frequency band. That's because the same band is used by two different technologies, but in different places. If the transmitters are, and the receivers are far apart, then there is no problem in using this frequency for some different technologies. Okay? For example, if you're uh, using the same frequency, let's say F1, in Istanbul and in Ankara, no problem, as long as, of course, it depends on which frequency you're using. If it's long wave, it may depend. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I should thank uh, Professor Ian Akilis uh, for the slides. Uh, this chap in this chapter, we have reused most of his slides. So this is also from him. Uh, this is the uh, spectrum utilization in a given 
frequency band. The important thing is actually the following. Some parts of the, by the way, the x-axis is the frequency band and y-axis is the amplitude. Some parts of the band, as you can see, are in heavy use. Some are in mi uh, medium use, they're mildly used. Again, heavy use. And even some parts may not be used at all. It is possible. Okay? So, actually, the use of the spectrum, the utilization of the spectrum, depends on the frequency. It also depends on the time. This is what we observe at a given time. But it would be different during the morning, evening, noon time, the night, whatever. Like, if you look at uh, the midtown areas, typically that's where the business is run, they will, uh, in those places, GSM bands, UMTS bands, whatever, uh, the uh, mobile cellular uh, bands will be heavily used during the daytime. Uh, but at night, there won't be anyone around. Of course, in the case of taximists, used 24 hours a day. Uh, it's just vice versa uh, in the, for example, suburbs of the uh, city, because uh, during daytime, everyone has gone to office, so there will not be uh, many people left uh, at homes, and those people mostly would be using their landline phones, so uh, they will not be heavily used. So it's also depending not only on the frequency, but also on the time. Also, it depends on space. Like, uh, as I said, during the daytime, if you just fix the time and the frequency, you realize that a given frequency, uh, cellular frequency, is heavily used in midtown, but not in the suburbs. So it depends on time, frequency, and space. And we would like to actually utilize this. This is showing almost the same thing. As you can see, this part from 0 to 1 gigahertz is used with approximately 55% utilization, whereas these bands are almost unused. Okay? And this is, by the way, from a little bit starting from uh, lower than uh, 1 gigahertz up to 6 gigahertz are the frequency bands that are frequently used in most of the modern uh, electronic uh, communication devices. So spectrum usage is concentrated on certain parts of the spectrum. And a significant amount of the spectrum, uh, unfortunately, remains unutilized. According to the FCC, the fixed spectrum uh, assignment is approximately 15 to 85 percent based on temporal and geographical variations. Now that's terrible. 15 and 85, they're far apart. So it's really varying a lot. So I cannot say the spectrum is underutilized because parts of it are heavily utilized. But there are also parts that are really underutilized. Unfortunately, these underutilized sections are not always underutilized. So I have to be careful. So I cannot easily say, well, this part of the spectrum is underutilized, so let me just move a few uh, technologies out of here since it's underutilized. It won't affect many people. That's not a correct behavior because uh, they're sometimes underutilized and these are varying a lot in time. So there's limited available spectrum and inefficient spectrum usage. Is it really, uh, is there really a, a shortage of spectrum? Really, actually there is. At least for the part that is uh, ec economically feasible. Of course you could switch to very high frequency bands where there are almost no technologies at the moment. So you can just use that part. But the problem there is, they're very high frequencies, 
uh, it's at the moment uh, typically expensive technology and also due to that high frequency you have problems in power and also in signal propagation for example through the walls whatever so it's difficult to have indoor coverage with such technologies so cognitive radio actually comes into play at this point cognitive radio is the key enabling technology for what we call dynamic spectrum access now you know in uh, computer engineering and also in electrical engineering actually we love uh, playing with the names we have so many different names for similar technologies you can always find some difference so i cannot say cognitive radio and dynamic spectrum access are exactly the same thing but they're very closely related so you can consider them to be almost in quotes equivalent so there are different names for this uh, so we will be using in this course dynamic spectrum access and cognitive radio interchangeably as if they're exactly equivalent it's, uh, it provides the capability to use and also share the spectrum in an opportunistic manner that's also why actually another name for cognitive radio though it's not very frequently used is opportunistic radio because it's really working in an opportunistic manner wherever there's an unused spectrum try to utilize it and the dynamic spectrum access techniques should allow the cognitive radio to operate in the best available channel whatever best is pay attention it's not the optimum because it depends on what best is for you and for me also if everybody selects the best then you have collision there so when we say best actually we mean something like good or better so it is actually composed of several phases or several parts and the most important one is actually the first one the spectrum sensing part in spectrum sensing you try to determine which parts of the spectrum are used and which parts are unused actually we're interested in the parts that are not used okay so you try to detect what we call the holes the spectrum holes and try to communicate in these holes however as cognitive radio users we are considered secondary users or we are also called the unlicensed users because we don't have the license to operate in that frequency therefore the real owners of that uh, frequency band of that spectrum are called licensed users and they have priority over secondary users or the cognitive radio users or unlicensed users okay so you have to detect the presence of those licensed users because in cognitive radio there is one rule you should never ever break uh, cognitive radio should not harm the primary technologies okay it should work without uh, harming the primary uh, technology however of course there will be cases uh, you collide with the primary users if that happens you have to terminate that spectrum immediately to allow the uh, secondary user to operate uh, so that actually a little bit requires differentiating between primary users and the other secondary users if you're a secondary user and I'm a secondary user if I vacate the channel because you're communicating that's actually not fair because okay I'm an unlicensed user but you're also an unlicensed user so we should be somehow sharing the channel either you operate in this channel and I use the other one or maybe you use this channel for some time then I use it and you're not using it or maybe we're both communicating at the same time but you don't want to uh, differentiate too much between the secondary users but you should definitely differentiate between the primary and the secondary users therefore detecting the 
licensed users or the primary users is the most important concern here. There is yet another rule that is unbreakable. And if you're doing research on cognitive radio, that's something you should pay attention to. And that is, whatever you do, do not expect any change on the primary devices. Unfortunately, there are several uh, publications in the literature that are based on this assumption, but this is not realistic. The other technology has been there for several decades. People have invested in that technology. Now you expect people to buy new devices just because you also want to uh, use it when it's underutilized. Why would I spend more money so that you benefit from that? It's not very likely, okay? So uh, we should try to solve this problem without expecting collaboration from the primary users. But we should be handling that problem. Okay, it's the concern of cognitive radio, not the primary radio. The other thing is selecting the best available channel. Okay, I have detected several spectrum holes. Which one am I going to use? Okay, that's yet another problem. That's called spectrum decision. The other one is spectrum sharing. We briefly discussed that. Okay, you're a secondary user. I'm a secondary user. But somehow we should both benefit from these uh, opportunities. So we should somehow share the channel. And the other one is vacating the channel when a licensed user is detected. That's called spectrum mobility. Now, up to now in wireless networks, when we said mobility, it meant the physical moment of the person and together with that person, the devices. Then for us, mobility meant, for example, handovers. Why would you have a handover? Because the device has moved from this location to this location. So the channel with the base station is now poor. So you would like to switch to another base station. That would be called a handover. Now it's different. In this case, I'm not moving at all. I'm fixed. Actually, nothing happens to the channel either. The channel is also still good. However, the primary user has entered, so I'm supposed to terminate it. Note that in the case of regular cellular networks, it is possible even for fixed users to have handovers, even without moving. Not very likely, but it still happens. Like when you're talking, if you just move around, actually that would cause a change in the channel. Because remember, the human body itself is actually uh, containing too much water and for such purposes it changes. Uh, also, there could be other sources of uh, interference or noise in the environment. So your SNR could deteriorate, so you would have to do a handoff. Or also there are other, yet other uh, cases like uh, the base stations could apply technologies like uh, cell breathing. Okay, you breathe in and out. When you breathe in, the cell size increases. That means actually uh, transmitter, the base station has increased transmission power. That's why the cell uh, range increases. Or breathes out in that case, decreases the transmission power. So even if you're not moving, because of the change in the transmission power, you may have to experience handoff. So those are the exceptional cases, but typically in regular cellular networks, mobility would imply, uh, actually, handoffs would be resulting from mobility, physical mobility. Here it's because of the introduction of the licensed users. Among these four steps, the most challenging one is spectrum sensing. People have been uh, studying this field for more than five years. Actually, detection, detection itself is much, much older. But in, in the area of cognitive radio networks, spectrum sensing has been studied a lot, but it's not properly solved yet. Still, uh, if you're doing research, that's one of the uh, most promising 
parts of cognitive radio if you're interested. So what is the network like? Uh, if we look at the uh, communication functionalities of the network, let's start from the bottom. It's always easier to explain from the bottom. At the very bottom, of course, you have physical layer. And on, uh, uh, this is the typical, it's not the full seven layer OSI uh, terminology, but it's something similar. Uh, so typically you have physical layer on top of link layer, network layer, transport layer. Forget about session and presentation layers. Put everything inside the application layer. Now, at the physical layer, you need to do spectrum sensing. But spectrum sensing somehow also relates to link layer. Okay? So it's touching the link layer, but mostly it's on physical layer, we should say. Spectrum sharing relates to link layer because we're talking about who accesses the channel. So that's typically a layer two operation. However, you should be aware of what's going on in the physical layer. That's why that touches also the physical layer. So uh, what you're exchanging is actually, you're exchanging sensing information between the spectrum sensing and the spectrum mobility function. Because according to what you have sensed, you make your decisions on spectrum mobility. Also on the spectrum decision side, you have to exchange this sensing information. And the spectrum decision function may also affect the reconfiguration of the physical layer, like which spectrum band to follow. Uh, similar things also occur here between the uh, spectrum sharing and the spectrum decision. You have to exchange uh, scheduling information and also reconfiguration. On this side, for the uh, function, you have to exchange the link layer delays to decide that. Because when you try to switch the uh, spectrum band, depending on this delay, you might be uh, causing problems in cult of service. In the network layer, network layer, as you know, is related to routing. So it relates to both spectrum mobility and decision. As you can see, you always have reconfiguration on the side. Similar is true for transport layer. But in that case, uh, the important thing for you is the delays in handoff and also the loss in the channel, uh, depending on which channel has been selected. In the application layer, all you need to do, all you need to exchange there is application control messages. And for the spectrum decision function, the most important thing that affects the uh, application would be the quality of service requirements. And spectrum mobility function and spectrum decision function should not be considered as two separate entities. They are closely related. Handoff decision depends on both. Selection of the current and the next candidate uh, spectrum band is also related to both of them. So what is cognitive radio? There are many different definitions of cognitive radio. So in the following slides, you will see the same thing defined in different ways. So let's just go over them very briefly. We'll not going to discuss them uh, in detail. But FCC defined in 2005 the cognitive radio as a radio that can change its transmitter parameters based on the interaction with the environment in which it operates. What does that mean? That means the cognitive radio should interact with the environment. Depending on the radio environment, it's changing its transmitter parameters. What are the transmitter parameters? Power, frequency, frequency modulation. All these need to be modified, OK, according to the environment. The environment, note that, is very dynamic. It depends on natural sources of noise plus primary networks plus other secondary devices like yourself. All these are actually modifying the radio environment. According to the changes in the environment, you make up your mind and you decide. And then you apply your decision 
when you apply your decision, which means you transmit according to that decision, actually you yourself is modifying the radio environment. So for the other cognitive radio users, now the environment has changed because of your decision. So in a distributed manner, maybe sometimes a little bit in a uh, centralized manner, you should be handling this. US Department of Commerce even made the definition. It's a radio or system that senses its operational electromagnetic environment, radio environment in other words, and can dynamically and autonomously, that means the device itself should be capable of doing this, it's radio operating parameters, in other words, the transmitter parameters, to modify system operation, such as maximize throughput, mitigate interference, facilitate interoperability, and access secondary markets. ITU, of course, also made another definition. It's a radio system that senses and is aware of its operational environment. That means some intelligence. Look at the radio environment, but intelligently decide. And dynamically and autonomously, again, emphasize, adjust its radio operating parameters accordingly. Why are we, by the way, emphasizing autonomous behavior? What does autonomy mean? Without any control? Without a central control, each device is capable of doing something. Why is it important? Why wouldn't I do it centrally? Because there may be local parameters. Because the radio environment is different for every part of the geography. And what else? Doing it in a central manner probably would be very slow. By the time you make up your mind, the environment has changed. So you have to do it typically in a distributed manner and in a very fast manner. It's not like, you know, you sense the environment here in Etilar. Someone else senses it in Kadıköy. Someone else senses it in Beşiktaş. Some people sense it in Konya. Some other in Antalya, Izmir, Erzurum, whatever. Everyone sends all this information to the capital city, and that's where BTK is. BTK, or someone else in Ankara, decides who uses which frequency at which part of the country. Sends it all the way back. And by the way, everybody, everything has changed. Even probably you also moved somewhere else. It's too late. Okay? So a central uh, decision would be uh, more difficult. So autonomous uh, decision is also important in that sense. IEEE, of course, also made a decision. So it's a type of radio that can sense and, again, autonomously reason about environment and adapt accordingly. As you can see, these are different definitions, but actually they're mostly saying the same thing. The key words are, it's a radio because it's doing transmissions. There is sensing, autonomous decision, and reasoning to get that decision. Look at the environment and be adaptive or dynamic. It could employ knowledge representation Automated reasoning, call the AI people. Machine learning, call the AI people in establishing, conducting, or terminating communication, or networking functions with other radios. The cognitive radios can be trained dynamically, again, and autonomously to adjust its operating parameters. So these are different definitions of cognitive radios saying the same thing. Uh, what are the advantages? It senses the radio frequency environment, RF environment, and modifies the frequency, power, modulation, and other transmission parameters. It allows for real-time spectrum management. Remember, the previous one we said was quasi-stationary. You make up your mind and apply it for several decades. Now, you make up your mind and immediately apply it. And also, you make up your mind for this 
area. For some other part of the city, people there make another decision and they apply their own decision. And significantly it increases spectrum efficiency. Because whatever spectrum holes we have in this area, we try to utilize it. Uh, possible cognitive radio functionalities would be the dynamic selection of the frequency, adaptive modulation, and uh, transmit power control. Adjusting these transmit uh, parameters based on location, where we are, and availability of the spectrum, and pay attention to sharing the spectrum between a licensee and a third party. That means the primary user, a licensed user of the network, and a third party, an outcomer, that's operating probably over a cognitive radio operator. Other functionalities are also being developed as the technology progresses. We could somehow set up some analogy between a cognitive radio uh, user and a car driver, especially the young drivers in Turkey, I should say. The capabilities of the uh, cognitive radio are what? It senses the environment, the RF environment. It is aware of what's going on in the environment. It also knows its own operational environment and its own capabilities. What it is capable of. Okay. It can dynamically and autonomously adjust its operate, uh, radio operating parameters accordingly, depending on the RF environment. It learns from its previous experiences. Like, at the moment frequency F1 might be idle. Should I switch to F1? Well, I did it several times before. Every time I enter that frequency, immediately a, secondary, uh, a primary user comes in, so I have to leave. And remember, frequency switching takes time and power. And I learned from my previous experience and say, well, it seems like in the frequency band F1, the primary users are having intermittent short transmissions. But that means they're coming very frequently. They take short transmission opportunities. But they're coming so frequently that every time I enter, I always get bumped out. So I prefer not to go there, although at the moment it's available. So I'm learning from my previous experiences. And deals with situations not planned at the initial time of design. You buy a device produced by the Koreans and you try to use it in Istanbul. They had no idea that you would be using it in Istanbul. Or the operator was not expecting this thing to happen, but due to several reasons, the traffic patterns might have changed. So, or the entrance of the primary users might have changed. We cannot control that, okay? So you should be able to handle unexpected situations. However, if you look at the car drivers, they're sensing, they're just looking at the roads. Not the, only the road, they're looking at the lanes of the road. Which lane is available, which is full. So they're doing sensing. They're aware of the operational environment, the, uh, the other lanes, and the current lane, and its capabilities. They can dynamically, especially the young drivers are very dynamic, I should say, and autonomously adjusting the driver operation accordingly. No one is communicating with the other drivers on the road to decide to which uh, lane he or she should go. Of course, you're signaling when you're changing the lanes, hopefully. But this is just for observation. You do a signaling and the other one observes that. Or you look at the availabilities on the lanes. This is just observation. But we don't have 
a centralized decision. No one is saying that, well, this car should be on the left lane, this one should be in the middle lane, and this one should be on the right lane. That's not the case. You're learning from your previous experiences. You're uh, learning from your experiences that, well, at the moment, the right lane might be empty, but there are often trucks on the right lane. So if you switch to the right lane, probably you will see another truck a few hundred meters ahead. So you will have to slow down once again. So you prefer not going to the right lane. And it deals with situations not planned at the initial time of learning to drive. Things are changing. Th those unexpected or unplanned things could also be the policemen on the highway. So they, they behave almost in the same manner. As we said, uh, the uh, utilization of the bands depends on frequency, time, actually also on space. But if you focus at a specific location, the use of the band, here you have the frequency uh, dimension, uh, the use of uh, utilization of the frequency bands or the spectrum depends on the frequency. Okay, as you see, this frequency band is idle, whereas this one is underutilized. This is heavily utilized, for example. But as time progresses, that usability pattern actually changes. This is the, by the way, here the uh, blue blocks are the primary user activities. Okay, so the idea in cognitive radio is first of all, at a given time, so just look at a single slice from here on the time domain, detect the hole, and then utilize the hole. But you should also detect the empty of the primary user. When a primary user arrives, immediately terminate that band and try to find another hole jump to that one. When the primary user comes, jump to another one. That's a co basic concept. Of course, this is easier said than done. First of all, do you always have such a hole? If not, then you're dropped. But if someone is to be dropped, it's always the secondary user, not the primary user. The second is, this is very nicely drawn. That's not the reality, of course. Like, as soon as the primary user arrives, you're leaving. How do you detect the primary user has arrived? It is highly probable that actually there will be a little bit collision in the beginning. And hopefully, the primary technology, whatever it is, remember this is some older technology. This is something that was deployed before cognitive radio. Hopefully, that primary technology can tolerate that much interference at the beginning that might, for example, have caused a drop in the data rate of the primary technology. But I would like to minimize my damage to the primary technology as much as possible. So as soon as I detect the existence of the primary user, I jump. Of course, some of you may think about problems like, what if I don't? We should have some means of detecting such problems. For the moment, for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that people are honest. And the devices are trying their best, uh, best to avoid uh, overlapping with the licensed or primary users. So the ultimate objective of cognitive radio is to detect the holes, avoid interference with the primary networks, and utilize the holes as much as possible to maximize utilization. But remember that you're not the only cognitive radio user. There are also other cognitive radio users that are trying to do the same thing. So if you all attack the best available channel, you will all collide, and the other close to best channels will still go underutilized. So you have to do it in an efficient manner. Also, there's yet another thing as what is best for me may not be the best for you. 
we may also utilize this. Okay, but there are things we should be looking at. So cognitive radio enables the use of temporally underutilized uh, or unused spectrum. So we're trying to detect spectrum holes. That's also called white space. White space term is also very frequently used. Especially you will hear about white space database in the future. We'll be talking about that. And if this band is further used by a uh, licensed user, you're supposed to terminate that band immediately and hopefully find another opportunity for yourself. You should also alter the transmission power uh, level and the modulation scheme and also other transmission parameters to minimize harm to the primary users, maximize utilization while being fair to other secondary users. The main characteristics are you should have cognitive capability. That means the ability to make intelligent decisions, to sense and after the words make some intelligent decisions. Another one is, okay, you have made a decision. You said, I'm going to change my spectrum. I'm going to change. You should be capable of doing this. <coughs> and how do you do this? Especially when we're talking about a wide spectrum. How can you jump from a low frequency to a high frequency or vice versa? And change your uh, modulation so frequently. So your device should be reconfigurable. And for that, we'll talk about the software-defined radio concept. So the first thing is you should be aware of the spectrum, aware of the radio environment. So you should capture or sense the information from the radio environment. In other words, listen to the radio environment. And from the signal, combined signal you receive, you should be able to detect the existence of a primary user or not. Capture the temporal and spatial variations in radio environment, which means don't look at just the current moment, but also look at what has happened in the past for every frequency band. Because for every band, the primary user activity could have a different pattern. And try to detect the pattern. This might be helpful for you. Okay. If you expect a primary user entrance to a specific uh, spectrum band, you may want to avoid it. Or you may even want to avoid sensing the channel. If you know that even if it's available, you will be avoiding using that channel. Okay. Uh, you should avoid interference to other users. Definitely not to the primary users and of course, we also want to, don't want to do it for the secondary users. Identification of unused spectrum portions at a specific time and location. And selection of best or close to best spectrum and appropriate operating parameters. For reconfigurability, then you have to enable the radio to dynamically be programmed for the transmission and reception on a very large set of frequency bands according to the radio environment. Of course, that would not mean the whole spectrum, which is not possible. So you should, your device should be capable of uh, utilizing at least most of the uh, feasible spectrum. And you should also be able to use different transmission access technologies supported by that hardware design. In other words, actually, your hardware design should be made such that these are possible. If you look at, in general, the uh, wireless transceivers, this is not cognitive. This is the regular uh, wireless transceivers. It's composed of two parts, the RF section and the baseband section. The baseband, let's first talk about the baseband section. The baseband section is mostly digital. So you have, that's where you have actually your DSP chips. And it's working at low frequencies, 
It's very your circuitry. Digital circuitry is actually running. It works at low frequencies, and actually, a fixed frequency. Okay. Whatever your transmission frequency is, your baseband is actually always working at the same frequency band. That's where you do all your DSP operations. The RF section carries your signal in the baseband to the frequency band in which you're allowed to transmit or receive. So if you're transmitting, the RF section takes the signal in the baseband section and transforms it to, uh, carries it to the spectrum in which you're allowed to transmit and transmits it. On the reception side, the signal comes from uh, the band in which you're allowed to communicate. RF section now takes it down to the baseband frequency where you can operate. Okay? So, in more detail, this is where your antenna is. Okay? Uh, we are looking at the RF transmitter side. So, you have your baseband signal in the digital baseband section. You do the uh, unlock to digital conversion. You do modulation and DSP operations. These are all done in the uh, digital baseband section where you do compression, coding, modulation, and shaping. These are finally convert. For example, this is like this is your telephone. Okay, whatever your voice. Uh, your voice is, is actually in analog. So this is converted to digital, processed. But then, in the RF section, it will first take this digital signal, the processed voice, and convert it to analog. And then, the up converter and the modulator work with the carrier signal. It is specific frequency. It's actually the frequency in which you're allowed to transmit. So that's actually what you're tuning. If you need to change the frequency, that's what you're changing, not this part. Okay. So you modulate it according to the carrier frequency, and then do the proper amplification, and send it to the antenna, which will create the electromagnetic signals in the air for transmission. The receiver is actually the inverse of this, you receive from the air the electromagnetic waves in the air will cause a signal, an electrical signal to be created on the antenna which will be received by the RF section. But note that what comes from your antenna is actually a combination of all electromagnetic waves in the air. Like you're using your cell phone with, let's say, GSM technology. But actually, it's receiving electromagnetic signals from the TV stations, from the radio stations, from the remote controls, and also even other noise, like those that are coming from the engines of the trucks, from outer space, whatever. Everything is received. Okay? Now, you have a combo of all these signals. And you're not interested in most of them. You're only interested in a single signal, which is using the frequency which has been assigned to you, your communication frequency. So you apply your RF filter, which will filter out all the other signals, only focus on the band in which you're allowed to transmit or receive, okay? After the filter, you have the low noise amplifier, and using your carrier frequency, you try to detect the signal itself, and apply unlock to digital conversion to take it, uh, convert it to a digital signal. So in the RF section, Image rejection, low noise gain, down conversion, and channel selection, all these have been done. Now at this point, 
at the outcome of the ADC, I have a digital signal, ones and zeros. Okay? That is fed into the demodulator and DSP, and finally converted to an analog signal, which is, for example, played on the speakerphone of your telephone. Okay? So in the digital baseband section, equalization, demodulation, decoding, and decompression. All these are done. Okay? So, as you can see, the uh, RF transceiver is almost the inverse of uh, the transmitter, except that here you're just creating a signal in your carrier frequency, whereas in this one, a combo signal arrives, you filter out the unnecessary parts, then the rest is almost inverse of the transmitter. So that was what we had today. So the basic non-cognitive radio architecture is when we're talking about data communications. It's like you have a network device which is communicating through a processor. The information from the processor is fed into the data modem which is making use of a transmitter and receiver, in short, a transceiver, to send the signal, which uses the antenna coupling to transmit that signal. In the cognitive radio architecture, you should take this and modify it as follows. Uh, there is one part, which is the data transceiver uh, operations. So still you have the processor, data modem, and the transmit and receive operations, which is communicating over the antenna. However, while doing these communications, you should keep on scanning, sensing, and avoiding interference operations in parallel. So while communicating, you should also have a scanning engine which scans the received signal. Okay? This time, I might be also looking at the other frequencies, feed it into a spectrum analysis engine, and that should detect the available channels and give them to the channel pooling server, which will communicate with the rest of the trans uh, transceiver system. So that the next time you want to transmit something, for example, you might be selecting an available channel. Another available channel, let me say. So the physical architecture of the cognitive radio transceiver would be something like this. On this side, you have the antenna. Okay? And on this side, you have the user the interface, let me say. Okay? And this is the... Uh, transceiver uh, side of it. Now, uh, we will be showing the receive operation on the top half and the transmit operation on the second half. It's actually the same thing, but to explain it. Uh, let's first look at how you transmit. Okay? So from the user, you get some information. You do data processing in the processor and this uh, prepare what is to be sent, and that goes through the basement processing, all the modulation, whatever, and that is fed into the analog digital conversion, converted from digital to analog this time, and in the RF section, it is uh, prepared as the analog uh, the signal that is to be sent to the antenna, and it is transmitted. On the receiver side, you see from the antenna, the RF section takes it, remember, filters out the unwanted parts of the spectrum, only takes the one which is used for your carrier frequency, and uh, processes it, and you do the uh, this time to analog to this digital conversion, so that you get the digital signal here, which is 
going through the basement processing. At the end of the basement processing, you just have your data that has been received. Then you do the data processing, like detect the beginning of the frame, end of the frame, check if there is a, an error in the frame, whatever. And if everything is fine, then give it to the user. OK? Yes? There is two devices based on this architecture. One is two separate yes. devices? Communicating each other. OK. As cognitively. One is transmitting, one is receiving. OK. How they decide the frequency? Because they decide according to the end end ones. Uh, OK. That is something to be answered in the future slides, but let me put it this way. Uh, the, each one of us, actually, would be doing the sensing. Okay. Then we decide on the availability of the channels. Either completely autonomously, that means independently, or the better way would be in a collaborative manner. Like, you tell me your measurements, your observations. I tell you your mine, whatever. So in a collaborative manner, we tell each other our uh, measurements. Or maybe we don't tell each other, but we all report to the base station. And the available channels are found. Now, Depends on what type of an architecture you're assuming. If you're talking about an infrastructure-based architecture, then it would, there would be a base station. So the base station decides which channels are available. The base station also receives the requests from the clients and tries to do a mapping between the requests and the available channels. And then the base station would send the grant messages. While it is sending the grants, it would say, well, you use frequency one, you use frequency two, whatever. So that would solve your problem. However, if you don't assume this infrastructure-based approach, that means you go in an ad hoc manner, then the problem would be more difficult. In that case, if you, two of us are directly communicating, not over a base station. In that case, somehow, in a magical manner, we should agree on a channel. Now, that's a different protocol. There should be a way of communication between two of us to decide which channel to use for transmissions. We could, for example, have some people approach it that way. H fixed control channel over which we just do the communications for making this decision, not the real data communication. And see, this control communication is low bandwidth. There's not too much information to be sent back and forth. Okay, so many people could be utilizing a fixed control channel in some manner. In, for example, in a random access manner. Once we decide on one of those other available frequencies, we both switch to that frequency and communicate there. But the problem is, what's this control channel? This is called the common control channel. And <laughs> altogether, this problem is called the common control channel problem. And it's a pretty difficult problem. Some researchers completely ignore it. Ignore the problem. Some just say, I assume that at least the common control channel is fixed. In other words, the operator does not hire the uh, data channels, but at least it gets some uh, fixed control channels from that regulatory body in the country just for this purpose. So a limited amount of reserved common control channels, <coughs> and the rest is to be determined in an opportunistic manner. Some say even this one should be opportunistic. In that case, it's a quite difficult problem, because we don't have 
any fixed common cont uh, control channel to com communicate over. So you tell me your available frequencies, but I'm not listening to that channel at the moment. So how do we synchronize this? This is a quite difficult problem. There are some proposed approaches, but uh, for the moment still, the most viable one appears to be at least that part is fixed. But it's a quite difficult problem, as I said. Yes? I, I think in the US, uh, they are talking about allocating a common control channel now for, yeah. for the uh, MD region to TV. Uh, like yes, uh, for the, uh, that's what we call the uh, white space TV bands. Uh, Jem is right. Uh, in the US, for example, the discussion is uh, like, the TV bands, as we discussed during the break, uh, have been released in the US and also in Europe. Uh, and there's some uh, deployed networks at the moment uh, for the use of this. Uh, there, uh, for the uh, communication of control information, control messages, some band is reserved. That's not used for data. At least everybody knows where to transmit and receive those control channels. And then uh, the rest is done in an opportunistic manner. Uh, the uh, common control problem, as I said, is a difficult problem because also there's one uh, more important question uh, other than the one you ask. You try to communicate with me. How do I <laughs> even become aware of that? In other words, let's say you're dialing my phone. How does my phone learn that someone is calling? Forget about the real communication itself. At the first place, how do you do the paging? In regular networks, there's a paging channel. And my phone frequently is checking the paging channel. So if you call me over the paging channel, you're sending me a paging request. Not you, but the network is sending me a paging request. So when my phone realizes that it's being paged, it responds, a connection is set up, and then it starts ringing. But if you don't have a fixed paging channel. You try to page me over channel F1. I'm listening to channel F2. I don't receive your page request. I appear to be out of coverage. Actually, I'm covered, but not by. Uh, I'm not looking at F1. So this is, as I said, it's a quite important problem. But we have more important problems before coming to that. Yes. I have another question regarding power. As we know, the power is one of the most challenging problems in wireless technology, or the most challenging one. Here, it appears that up to so far, the, the fundamental of cognitive radio is listening or sensing. So I think it's the power consumption will be very, very much higher than the regular ones. If I listen to the channel 24-7, that would be a big problem, I think. I don't know. You think so, and you're right. Since you need to do sensing, just the same problem we had with uh, wireless sensor networks, actually. Power is one of our primary concerns. The good side is this time these sensing devices are now our phones. They're not uh, sensors that are just thrown out of uh, a plane or whatever uh, into the environment and uh, which will uh, have their batteries decayed soon. That's not the case. It's your cell phone, so you're recharging. That's the good news. Uh, but you're right, sensing is a very power-consuming operation. Actually, uh, if you look at the power consumption of transmission and reception, sensing is done with reception, uh, there's not much difference. Receiving and transmitting are consuming almost the same power. Therefore, if you're uh, listening 24 by 7, it's huge power consumption, you're right about that. Uh, the answer to that falls into the following. Don't listen to any 4 by 7 Then the question is, how do I detect the channels? And that's where collaboration comes into play. If, <clears throat> for example, in uh, this room, if you're, let's say, 10 people at, this, uh, at, in, uh, at one moment, we don't all need to listen at the same time because we're so close to each other that whatever my phone receives is almost 
exactly received by your phone and by his phone, by her phone, whatever. So why are we doing this? All of us. I can select a subset of the users here to receive, uh, sorry, to sense the channel, okay? Uh, so that the others may rest. They may save their power. But then I have to rotate this for even consumption of power. Uh, and remember, there's not only one frequency. So I may say, some of you listen to F1, some of you listen to F2, the others rest. Then I will switch. Now you rest, you listen to F1, and you listen to F2, then I will switch, whatever. This is what we call spectrum uh, sensing scheduling. It's not transmission schedule, but this is sensing schedule. Who listens to which frequency and when? I should have sufficient number of sensing devices at any time for a given uh, frequency band so that I can make a decent decision about that. That's, we have a paper, uh, actually several papers on this. Uh, one of my PhD students, Sali Mariet, is working on this problem. That's his PhD thesis. And he has published several papers, uh, including uh, transactions on vehicular technology. What you're doing with him is uh, actually deciding who should listen to which channel. Uh, and the, uh, there's, we have a limit like delta. That's the, the minimum number of sensing devices. I have to guarantee that. Then if I don't have sufficient number of sensors or uh, cognitive devices in this environment, in that case, I would like to select the frequencies that are worth sensing. If some of the frequencies are not worth sensing, that means either the channel is terrible here, I know it from my previous experience, or uh, the channel could be fine, but I know that uh, it's under heavy use, so I'd like to avoid it. So I don't schedule that at all. So there are some solutions to that, but you're right, power consumption is a major problem. So I have to select it in an intelligent manner. Therefore, for all these purposes, I, it will come to that later on. We'll be talking about the ad hoc infrastructure, uh, the, sorry, the ad hoc mode and the infrastructure-based mode. But I would strongly recommend that you typically go for the infrastructure-based mode. Because there you have collaboration in an easier manner. In ad hoc mode, you could also do collaboration, but it's much more difficult. In infrastructure mode, it's more reasonable. But there are cases where ad hoc mode could be important, like military applications. If you're going to do, uh, if you're going to execute a military action in a foreign country, which would be your enemy country, then you cannot reserve a common control channel there. You cannot deploy base stations before you start the operation. Okay? So on enemy land, you would have to work in an uh, ad hoc mode. That means without any infrastructure. Then you have to cope with most of these problems. But in that case, typically, you don't have a very huge number of uh, transmitter-receiver pairs. It's not like millions of soldiers are trying to communicate over cognitive radio at the same time. Uh, most of the time, you don't have many bandwidth-hungry applications. Like those soldiers would not be uh, watching YouTube videos or uh, using their Facebook accounts while fighting. So you have minimized uh, all these. Uh, video sometimes could be very important, especially for reconnaissance, but 
Then, for example, you could decrease your FPS, the frames per second. You don't want HD transmission uh, from the uh, field, uh, battlefield, but uh, several uh, pictures per second or several frames per second might be sufficient to detect how much damage a bombing has given, for example. So uh, there, there are cases of the use of ad hoc, but for uh, civilian use, the uh, infrastructure-based mode seems to be more promising. Also, considering the fact that in the case of civilian use, mostly people try to communicate with other people or other data sources, like the websites, not in the cell, but outside the cell, then you need something like a base station that connects you either to the internet or the PSTN, whatever. Therefore, an infrastructure mode is more important there. So this is what you need to do. And well, you have to manage all these resources, all these components. Therefore, you need control uh, parameterization, which means reconfiguration, which means your device, your radio, should be configurable by the software. In other words, it's defined by the software. That's why it's called software-defined radio. Each component in this case, in the case of uh, software-defined radio, can be reconfigured via a control bus, as we discussed here, to adapt to time-varying RF environment. And in the RF front end, the received signal is amplified, mixed, and converted according to these parameters. And in the baseband unit, or the modem, the signal is modulated or demodulated, depending on whether you're transmitting or receiving, and encoded and decoded. And it's similar to usual transceivers. Actually, the important thing is taking it down to the baseband. Once you take it down to the baseband, it's similar to regular uh, transceivers. Now, the novelty of the cognitive radio is in the RF front end and the data processing uh, part, which is actually doing the spectrum management, which frequencies to use. Uh, especially, what we need is a wideband sensing capability in the RF front end. And this function is mainly related to the RF hardware technologies that are available, such as the wideband antenna, power amplifier, and adaptive filters. The RF hardware for cognitive radio, therefore, should be capable of tuning to any part of a large range of frequency spectrum. Not all of the spectrum, as we said. That's impossible, but a reasonably large part of it. It could be. Uh, actually, let me stop here. And uh, next time, let me continue from this point on, uh, because I don't want to uh, break the discussion in here. Uh, I would like to cover it in one shot. Any questions? Uh, from yes. the previous uh, figure, uh, it looked like to me that uh, this control parameterization operation and the communication, the main communication, looks like they are two separate, maybe related, but separate operations, and they may be running in parallel, right? In, right, yeah, in, it, this is the larger view of it. Uh, actually, don't see this line, which is your control bus, and what's written here. This is actually your uh, transceiver receiver. Okay? The point here is, uh, for example, when you're trying to transmit, you get the data from the user and base process it, do uh, ADC, and uh, send it to RF section, and finally send it over to your antenna or in the reverse direction, just the inverse of this. So this is your regular communications part. But while communication is proceeding, whatever you receive, in parallel, 
you're processing it to decide on the existence of the primary users. So what we see in here is your actual data to be sent or received, but in parallel, you should also look at the signal that has been received and from that try to conclude whether there was a primary transmitter or receiver. That's something to be done in parallel. Let's actually explain it better in here. What you see in here, this part, is actually this thing. While, and this is your data transmission and reception operations running here. While you're doing this, so from your network device, you get the data, process it, do the uh, modulation, demodulation, and finally transmit it over the antenna. But meanwhile, in parallel, you have to do this. This is not producing any data for the computer or your phone's, let me say, user interface. However, in parallel, it's also running to detect the spectrum holes and also the entry and leave of the primary users. So, yes, you're right. These two are running in parallel. This part, the outcome of this part, let me say, is shown here on this data, uh, on this control bus. Whatever you decide from these, okay, you take, for example, the available channels, which frequency uh, to use, which modulation to use, at which power to transmit or receive, then you prepare the parameters for those and apply the corresponding parameters to these boxes. Okay? Does it answer your question? Mm -hmm. yes. Any other questions? Yes. 